hope I hope I'm worthy of all of it. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for staying. Um, having been a law student, and I understand how precious this time is, and uh, thank you for staying. Uh, I also particularly want to thank all of the um, student uh, who have been organizing uh, at this day today, so that we could all come together. And um, Becky and I were laughing together. I uh, said it's very important. Um, having come from the Paul College of Law where uh, we too have a Center for Intellectual Property. Uh, we have to remember that the IP and IP doesn't stand just for patents. And um, that there are um, other uh, uh, avenues of intellectual property as well. And uh, it's, it's kind of interesting to think about uh, entertainment law and music law and theater law uh, being in that realm as, as well. And, and so it is. So again, I want to thank the uh, student organizers today for thanking, uh, for giving us the time to make uh, this information available and uh, hopefully for um, encouraging some disciples along the way. Um, in theater, it's always uh, very, very worthwhile to be able to be the closing act, so uh, here we are. And uh, something about theater law that you should all know is that it is truly a conglomeration of, of law. It's, it's, it's an amalgam. It's uh, very obviously contract law. It is also equally obvious that it is copyright law, and um, it's also tort law as well. But I think um, along the way, you're also going to see that most of all of this is presented against the backdrop of, of copyright law, particularly. Um, most attorneys, when they get involved in the entertainment business, uh, whether it be music law, theater law, um, I also do film law, publishing law, the first thing they do is they look at it as a contract, and that certainly is, is the proper thing to do. But they have to realize that even though it is essentially contract law, uh, it has got to be read again within the purview of, of copyright law. And uh, those seem to be the two bits that really, really uh, must go together. Um, as I said, uh, the reading the, reading the contract is certainly the, the first thing to do, but we also have to look at the fact that um, there's much copyright, and very specific kinds of copyright that go into a theater law. Um, most, um, most copyright, most, most theater law is uh, usually done with a partner. Somehow or other, you always have someone that is, is helping you in, in some way. And uh, so then the big issue becomes, is this actually joint authorship, this play that is, is, has been being written? And uh, the way the courts are going to decide that is from the very, very outset, they look to see, was this the intent from the very, very beginning? Uh, we have two very famous cases, uh, the Children's Taylor case, where uh, two women sat down to write a play about uh, Mons Mobley, who was a very, very famous black entertainer. And uh, the one playwright, uh, if you will, um, thought that they were writing it together. And uh, the other playwright said, no, we were not. Uh, I had the idea. Not that idea necessarily counts, but I did have the original idea. And um, I've done a lot of the writing of the dialogue, and about the only thing you've had to offer is the research. And so it was not, from the outset, the intent of these two women to be co-authors, uh, co-playwrights on this piece. Uh, the courts did a, it's, it's a, a really interesting case uh, to, uh, to read and, and to teach, because the courts used almost everything they could find. They used the playbill, they used um, advertising flyers, and there definitely was one name that was more prominent, if you will, than the other. And so the court said in this situation, this was not joint authorship, that just the one playwright uh, was actually the playwright. And the other person, for all intents and purposes, just had supplied quality, but had really done nothing more than just supplying the research to give the play validity, if, if you will. The other play that uh, you're all familiar with is Rent. And uh, of course, there was much tragedy involved in, in that the original playwright um, died um, as the play was truly going on the boards. And when the play was first put together and presented at the public theater in New York, um, well, critics have been kind. They used the word rambling. And they
they decided that this play definitely had to be tightened up. And so they brought in a woman from um, NYU, uh, very much, um, uh, had much worth in, in, in the uh, business of theater and uh, writing theater. And um, she worked along with the original playwright. Um, somehow, along the way, she came up with the idea that she really was also a co-author. And again, the, the um, courts went back, they looked at um, parole evidence that they had had, conversations, uh, they had looked at letters, uh, and uh, they came up with the intention that no, she really had been brought in to uh, do something that we refer to as being a play doctor. And uh, she was being brought in. Uh, Neil Simon, this is the way he first started out uh, actually in the theater, was brought in to sort of tighten up this play and uh, to make it presentable and put it on, on the boards. And uh, so this is going to be something that uh, is going to be one of the issues that we'll always have um, in, in the theater. Um, the, um, the other uh, contributors that you're going to find along the way when we start talking about, about theater law is um, the fact that many of the people that are involved in putting a production on the stage are really independent contractors. And when I'm teaching film law, this is one of the places where we sort of diverge because for the most part, believe it or not, even people like Steven Spielberg when he first started out was actually writing for the studio. And most of the people that are in Hollywood are writing for a studio. They are essentially uh, work for hire. Whereas in theater, most of those people are going to be independent contractors. And uh, again, <coughs> the courts go back to the old CCMV. Those of you who have had copyright one, um, you know about that case, and uh, which just draws its elements from agency. And so, uh, we're looking, as always, at uh, who supplied the materials, did the person work on their own, um, what exactly was the hiring situation, did they get a W-4 form, and were there benefits supplied. And uh, in most instances, as I said, um, the, in theater, you're going to find that these people will be uh, independent contractors. And these are the costume designers, the lighting designers, uh, choreographers, and um, they all come together to make theater um, as we as we know it uh, to, to be. Um, there are even other extraneous players who may not be legal people as such, and this is where we get into the whole role of the unions. The unions are very very important, particularly in American theater. And uh, even though I am the, the daughter of a banker, um, it's. I, I'm very sympathetic to uh, the, the unions uh, in, in, in American theater. Uh, why do we have the unions? Well, for the most, for the reasons that uh, we usually do. There have been great, great abuses um, in, in American theater. There's been great abuses in theater, period. And uh, these people work under just uh, horrific conditions. Um, years ago, uh, and I'm talking at the end, at the very, very beginning, of like the last century, I'm talking 1919, 1920, you went on the road and for some reason the show closed on the road, um, you were just stranded in Topeka. And uh, it was for you to get back to New York, uh, many times you would have to uh, supply your own costumes uh, and uh, you rarely, rarely were paid when you were in rehearsal and usually we use the rule of thumb that you were going to be in rehearsal about eight weeks for a musical um, for Shakespeare, and about six weeks for a comedy or a dramatic piece. So you were working all of that time, and as I said, 1919, 1920, I know that seems like eons away for, for many of you, uh, but for those of us who are involved in theater, I'm afraid it was only really yesterday. And so this gave to rise to the um, Actors' Equity, which is the theater union, um, particularly um, for actors. Um, you also have uh, IATSE, which is an acronym for all of the people who are involved in building scenery and uh, moving the scenery backstage. Again, um, many of these people uh, just sort of worked, again, if they were not in, um, in actual in production, while they would be in, um, in, in the rehearsal.
rehearsal period, they would be just working literally free of charge. I mean, they were living off savings or, or something of that nature. Uh, there was always great injury. Uh, we have the, we could spend another day talking about the injuries that go on uh, the backstage. Or we could read the headlines today about Spider-Man. And um, but uh, you know, uh, this is this is an area where again, because of the tremendous abuses against these people, you have the strength of these unions. You also have something that are guilds. These are usually more professional kinds of organizations. You have the Writers Guild, you have the Directors Guild, and uh, again, these come about because of the abuses uh, for many, many years, um, probably into the late 19th century. You wrote a play, you presented it to a producer, and that was the end. You never saw royalties again or, or any of that type of situation. And so through the use of the guilds, these people now are able to write some really amazing contracts. And uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, when you were speaking so well about the licensing, uh, it's, uh, it's very important. We call those licenses royalties. And uh, these people, uh, your playwright licenses the uh, play out, and uh, it becomes uh, really uh, an, an economic uh, benefit um, to the people in, involved. Um, something we always think about in the United States is the this, is this theater that's um, on, on Broadway. And um, many of us also are very much aware that many of these abuses were also in place because of, of, of racism and uh, the uh, Jim Crow laws of the United States and uh, the whole parallel industry, if you will, the whole parallel, parallel universe of, of black theater um, that uh, was absolutely, I mean, again, and it was just absolutely horrific. These people obviously were not allowed to be in um, white hotels. They were not allowed to eat in white restaurants. Um, many of them uh, were not even allowed to ride on the railroad, which is slightly ironic since most of your Pullman servers were blacks, but they would not be allowed to ride on the railroads. And so they would bus around the country. Uh, this would be another reason why you would have the rise of, of the unions. Um, the, uh, along with now, we see uh, the, the role of unions and the role of guilds and the place of tort law and property law and copyright law, we're also very, very much involved uh, with immigration law uh, because there are so many international actors that we now bring um, to the Broadway stage and uh, just really even to regional uh, stages uh, as well. Uh, when I was working for the uh, Department of Cultural Affairs uh, for the city of Chicago, I finally said to them one day, you know, am I in entertainment law or am I into immigration law? Because we would have so many uh, incidents where we were bringing, oh, international puppeteers, or we were bringing in uh, musical performers, uh, we were bringing in um, small stage uh, performances, and we were bringing them from overseas. And um, nobody ever bothered to you know, see if these people uh, could get through the I-9s. I became an absolute authority on an HB1, which deals with, are these people really special? Uh, can, can we not find these kind of people in the United States? Actors' equity gets very, very involved with this. They are very, very protective. Um, you all know the show Miss Saigon. Um, they were very, very protective. That role go to an American actor, Miss Saigon. And when they brought in Leah Salanga, they said, you know, who is she? And what are her credentials? And it becomes very embarrassing because these people actually have to prove their credentials. Well, Leah Salanga happens to be a very, very important um, Philippine. Uh, she's performed a great deal in, in the Philippines. Um, she has not only gold records, she has platinum records. And so um, she ha finally had the credentials, but her people fought long and hard for her to keep that role on going away. The same thing was true with Jonathan Price. Um, he was playing a, um, uh, a, um, the engineer, 
and um, he was playing it um, in costume because he is a non-Asian, and the, call, the role called for a Eurasian, and so um, they uh, said no that he couldn't play the role that we had. You know, they had to uh, find someone. He was coming from the British stage, and uh, mm -hmm. finally, again through verification of his credentials, he was allowed to, to play that role. Um, we had a situation in Chicago, the other Simon Coles was coming to do uh, a show, he does a one-man show uh, about Dickens, and uh, because he is British and has the ear for all of their different languages and, and, and dialects, um, he was able to do all of the various Dickens characters, and uh, at almost the last moment, I mean, he was virtually in the air, uh, the Chicago branch of Chicago the actor's equity said, well, we're not really sure. I mean, obviously, there's somebody in Chicago that could do British accents. And um, the theater was like, you know, this is not about doing British accents. This is about someone who has the validity to present Dickens and um, all of the colorful characters about which he has written. And uh, he's not only done the research, but he's also, um, he has also written this, this play as well. So uh, there are these, these very, very um, um, energetic uh, forms of protection that uh, are going on uh, in the stage uh, as well. And um, the whole uh, issue, too, believe it or not, of, of, of state trusts uh, law, it's, this is very, very important because copyright now in the United States, as you know, is um, for the life of the author and 70 years, which means that much of this material becomes part of an estate. This is where I'm going to lose everybody, but it's all right, I lose my students all the time. They can understand that you can pass on a car, they can understand that you can pass on a house, but when I say that, um, you know, if your grandfather or grandmother wrote a musical, um, that is also a part of the estate, and it is. And um, there is a lot of protection, again, Goes in, get, becomes involved in the whole area of um, a state and trust. Um, the uh, playwright can originally write bits and pieces um, into um, his or her will. Uh, we just had an incident um, actually involving the Dana Center um, at, at St. Anselm's. Um, they were doing a production of Waiting for Godot. And uh, at the last moment, truly at the last moment, the tour, it was a national tour, it was, the tour was canceled. Why? Because Simon, uh, Samuel Beckett, if you've ever read that play, or if you've ever seen it, it's very specific. It's a very existential experience. There is to be truly um, no uh, vicinity to be identified. It's all about uh, man's uh, existential existence. And I used the word man's particularly in this point because at one time there were four female actors that wanted to do it. And the states and the estate said, absolutely not. These, these are four men and they have their names. And what they were doing with this latest national tour is they were placing it in New Orleans after Katrina. And the estate came out and they said, no, we don't think so. You cannot place it like that in time and place. It's about humanity and humanity's um, existential existence. And so the national tour was, was canceled. Um, the, um, uh, as I said, I, we talked, I think, enough, and, and I, I wouldn't even attempt to try to repeat um, all of the good information that you got about licensing. But there's a great deal of licensing that goes on um, in, in the theater as well. Um, all of those wicked t-shirts and uh, the mugs and um, the posters, um, those are all pieces that are licensed out for the production um, of the show. And uh, the producers in those situations, those will all be part of the profits for which they have to be um, answerable. Um, lastly, um, you have the whole role of, um, uh, I shouldn't say lastly, that's two lastlies. Um, now all of a sudden we're becoming very, very involved with labor law. Uh, for a long time in the theater it's been very, very difficult for us to get um, any kind of protection under, under labor law. Um, very, very little protection um, under, under workers' um, compensation. Because again, most 
of the people involved, as I've said before, are independent contractors. And so they are expected somehow or other to uh, carry their own insurance. Um, we have seen, though, and I mentioned it um, with um, you know, some jocularity, uh, that about Spider-Man. But Spider-Man has been so egregious in what they have been trying to do, what, what Julie Timor has been trying to do with stage machinery and the, and the human body and, and, and such like that, that um, not only um, has the uh, Department of Labor of the State of New York come forward and uh, brought fines against the production, but um, also um, the um, OSHA is looking into some of the um, accidents um, as, as well. Um, staying with um, Spider-Man, um, as, as Mr. Graves said, um, in, these, in, in these situations rarely do we want to go into, into a litigation. And that certainly is true in, in, the, um, in, in the theater world. Uh, producers and directors um, do not want to become known as being difficult to work with. Um, the actors most assuredly do not want to become known as being difficult to work with. And so many times you're going to find that we go into mediation. This is an area that um, I, I, I really enjoy. And um, it's, it's really very, very satisfying. Uh, right now, um, Julie Taymor has been asked to leave the production. And uh, all we know is that um, she is being bought out um, in some way. Um, whether she will work again, it's going to be a long time to see that. And uh, it's a great loss because, as you know, her really, really big piece um, is, is The Lion King, which is an amazing piece of theater. And uh, I think she was, you know, perhaps uh, a little bit ambitious as, as to what she was trying to do with, with Spider-Man. But those, those are her, um, her judgments um, as an expressive person. That's the best I can say there. We're not gonna, I'm sure we're not ever going to find out exactly what has happened between her and the producers, but that's because it's all gone to mediation and will be um, addressed um, in, in that way. Um, some of the big issues that uh, we're looking at right now is um, directors are wanting more and more to have their director books copyrighted. And uh, when you are directing a show, um, there is a very elaborate way that you put together the script uh, and all of the ideas that you have in, um, that has you, you want the, uh, the actors to move um, in, the, in the stage picture. And uh, the first case that we have that went to uh, court, and, and uh, unfortunately, but it did, and uh, it's a, involving a, a wonderful production, uh, um, Love, Valor, Compassion. And uh, there was, that when it was on Broadway, then it went into uh, availability um, through the various people, that, the various agents that make these plays available, people like Samuel French, uh, Tans Whitmore. And um, you are able to, uh, they were doing a production in South Florida, and someone saw it, and they went to the original Broadway uh, director, and they said, you know, they are totally remounting your show. And um, he actually came forward and litigated, and uh, the, uh, the, the courts found out that the show in Florida definitely was uh, an infringement. Um, we had a situation in Chicago where somebody was doing a, a, um, a production of um, uh, the Gary show, just, just went out of my head. But again, um, he was staying very, very close to the original production, which was, which was what he was saying, because our defense in that kind of situation is the set up fair. In other words, there's just, there's just only so many ways that you can present so many ideas. And, uh, but uh, the court said yes, or actually the attorneys that wrote the cease and desist letters said, yeah, that was true. But um, how close is close, and you're really, too close, and so uh, the production um, ended. Um, the other piece uh, that we are, uh, the other really, really big issue is um, the, uh, the role of costumers. Um, costumers are always, always trying to get their costumes to be um, copyrighted, the designs to be uh, copyrighted, and um, the courts come back 
since 1941, and they say continuously, no, these are not copyrighted because they are practical. They are, they are clothes, and I mean, don't we all wear clown suits out into the street, right? <laughs> Raw. But anyway, um, so um, that's become a big issue uh, as far as, uh, again, as I said, costumers are always trying to, uh, to, to get that kind of copyright protection. Um, how do you get involved as, um, an, as an attorney to one of these companies? Well, usually, what I have always found is that, unfortunately, the last person in the office is usually the one that is given these kind of issues, you know. And um, I, I work with um, there are so many people, particularly in Chicago, and uh, who do work for, like, um, uh, say, the Goodman Theater or for Steppenwolf. You'll always say to them, you know, how did you ever get a job like that? And they'll say, well, you know, I just have to be around late one night, and, <laughs> and that was it. And uh, because they really don't do that much work, they are still in the firm doing the, uh, the, the kind of work that brings in uh, the, the money. And um, but there is great money to to be made in this uh, in this business. Um, I've been overseas and. I think in every language in the world, I have seen um, uh, Lovette and La Belle, uh, De Vista and uh, De Schoena, uh, you know, I mean, those are all the really, really big Walt Disney productions that, that, go, over, that go overseas. And, um, but I have seen, um, which is kind of interesting because art started in Paris, came to America, and we were in Paris one time, and there was a group doing um, art um, in English. And um, it had been uh, licensed out um, in, in some way. So um, what, what I would suggest you do and what most of us do is when I wear my other hat and I talk about um, putting boards of, of, of trustees and directors together, um, I always talk about the fact that this is a wonderful way to get involved. Um, that, um, the first thing I always tell uh, the board when they're getting themselves together is you need to have CPA, you need to have somebody who's doing marketing and PR, and you need an attorney. And uh, at least uh, you can you know, get involved and, and volunteer your time, at least in the beginning, uh, to, to help these people, these terribly, terribly, terribly creative people. Uh, they're, they are sensitive, though, and many times they, as I said, I, I, my heart goes out to Julie Taylor, because I know that uh, she, expressively what she wants to do play of Spider-Man is it's just going to be so terribly imaginative. But you know, then there's some kind of fine line where it all has to um, be rethought. So um, in, in closing, um, the, uh, all I can say is that um, the Bard tells us that um, the play is the thing. Um, he also said kill all the lawyers, but we're going to forgive him on that. And, um, he, al he also said uh, that all the world is a stage, and every person has his or her role, and that's a, tr that's a copyright example of um, transformation. I'm allowed to say that under fair use, okay? And, uh, but anyway, uh, he says that uh, we all have um, our role, and I, I can't think of that as being a better summation for a discussion of theater law, because it is truly our production, uh, uh, this, this integration, so much of, of, of the law and uh, the attorneys that are, are involved in it. So thank you very much. I'm not as good looking as Cater is entertaining, but that's a try. <laughs> yeah, but you have courage to wear a bow tie. <laughs> Thank you very much for staying with us. It's a long day and your ears are tired. We don't have PowerPoint, so you don't have to worry about reading. So we just kind of do our act and routine up here so that uh, you can have a chance to see who we really are. If my voice drops a little low, just raise your hand in the back and whatever so I make sure that I keep up to the level that, that you need to hear in the room. I've been here once or twice and sometimes the level of speech gets a little low and you can't quite hear, so don't hesitate to, to give me a sign. I want to thank the governor of Maine uh, who started off my presentation today because he decided politically or whatever issue, depending upon how it's been reported, it hasn't been in the New York Times.
friend did, so I'm not quite sure. But off the internet, he decided he didn't like the labor murals up in the Department of Labor building in, in Maine, and has asked to be moved and transferred. Uh, and there's a big uproar going on in the internet at the present time amongst the people in Maine and the artists who did the murals under a public commission from the Commission on Arts in Maine about the fact that they're removing the mural from from the particular meeting room that he didn't like and transporting it to another location uh, downtown in the city, I understand, but it hasn't been totally finished yet. Well, what happens is a perfect example for what art law is about because you've got a situation where there was a public commission for public art, and the best part of public art is that nobody ever likes it. And so <laughs> you go through all those routines about trying to create it, and then you have all the problems about to do with it, and once you put it up, nobody wants it to be there and all kinds of other issues. You can't move it too much under certain situations. So it's a question of, of, of contract. And what Kate didn't use as one of her lines, and they did want to use uh, as a line with, was it Metro Golden, Sam? Oh, I mean, it's, it's not worth a, an oral contract. It ain't worth the paper it's written on. <laughs> and that comes from Sam Goldberg. <laughs> and the other one was we don't do contracts, we do lunch. That's right. <laughs> so there's always a need for, for attorneys in this area. So the whole issue that's showing up is the, uh, the, the whole visual rights act for artists, the issue of a public commission. The question is whether it's really a work for hire and in the contract or the commission, whether there were some reservations made about the fact that it was site specific, and so consequently it was going to be permanent there or not, whether the work in fact being moved is destroying its way it was created, and that goes to the issue of denigrating the artist and, and the work of, of the has fear statute. So lawyers are in this business all the time. The purpose of my talk today, and, and Kate and I are on the soft side of intellectual property, we really like it. What makes it so interesting is that you meet the most creative people in the world. They're all kinds, with all kinds of wonderful ideas. They all do different things. They're pleasant to be with, they're pleasant to be around, and usually the quality of the wine at the receptions is considerably better than <laughs> the Marnock's game. So it's, it's the kind of thing that you either like or you don't like. Um, the best way it ever happened, I was on the board of directors for the Lawyers for the Creative Arts in Chicago, and there was a whole band of people who came together in, in the legal profession who decided that artists needed some assistance and they didn't have any money. And so they put together, through fundraising and whatnot, the Lawyers for the Creative Arts, and uh, there's a similar organization in New York called the Volunteer Lawyers for the Art. There's an organization in California known as California Lawyers for the Arts. Uh, in Maine, there's a Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts group. I'm not sure exactly the name that it has. There's a business community for the arts here in, in New Hampshire. It's a group of people who are concerned about providing assistance to the, to the people who are in the creative arts. The advantage of it is it, the people progress in people's careers take off, it's a nice practice. And the reason I would recommend that you think about it in terms of entertainment and, and arts law is because it gives you a softer sell on your CV, on your resume, because it's not the principal money maker for a firm. Very few people practice in this area. Uh, very few law schools in the country teach in this area, particularly in the arts area. And there's always a need for somebody who has an understanding. And what I like about it is when you take on an artist who really can't provide you initially, since they're beginning with a great deal of income, what happens is if they like you, they come back. You buy their house, you take care of their problems, you do their wills, and all the other legal business that slowly develops because they have confidence and trust in you. And so, it is, in some ways, a very, very, very good business. Um, art news in May of 2008, the U.S. art market is $25 billion. It's all about the money. There's a good practice in art law. Uh, the worldwide market is about $57 billion. This is 2008. It's going up considerably since the recession is now over in the art market. And the illicit art market is about 11 to $12 billion a year, at least that's what the Italian arts go out tells us, and we talk to them every now and then. Uh, there's a lot of money in this business, and the joy of it is the practice is totally worldwide, domestically, but also internationally. A lot of art moves. What makes art interesting is it's a one-of-a-kind situation.
damage except for prints, but usually they have to be under 200 units, or sculpture is usually also under 200 units to have major significance. But everybody wants to own the Picasso because that's the only Picasso Picasso did, and that's what makes it so worthwhile and so unique. You can spend a couple hundred thousand dollars for a Mercedes, but so can everybody else. But if you only own the one Picasso, it's yours. And that's what collectors get all particularly involved in. Well, I wanted to thank the, uh, the governor for doing that for me. Um, very interesting area, the textbook that a number of us use, there are different ones, and so it's no big deal. It's called Law, Ethics, and Visual Arts. It's by John Merriman and his associates. Uh, this is a student edition because it's in soft cover, but it's really a Bible. It is a resource tool in this particular area of practice. And hopefully this summer, if the art law cost makes up, we'll have a chance to get through it all. You won't have to read the whole thing. <laughs> you won't have to read the whole thing. But, so that's, that's kind of it. A lot of the practice in this area, because it's so interesting, and, and Kate mentioned it, and I think somebody else did as well, we're all familiar with the American Bar Association and their entertainment and sports law forum and their intellectual property forum, I'm sure you're all acquainted with to some degree. And they're the domestic issue uh, in terms of what's happening in those arenas. What you really should take a look at sometime if you have an opportunity is the International Bar Association. That's where all the major players are. That's where they go once a year. Uh, and then they have some secret meetings for different particular kind of sections. We belong to the section on cultural property law and intellectual property law. And that's where you meet the senior people in the field who are doing all the business. So when we want to go to Paris, we have lunch with the lawyer who represents the Louvre. It's, it's a nice way to make a living. It's, 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 a, it, it's a kind of thing that adds a little spark to your life. Also, just taking care of the local artists down the street who forgot to figure out how to protect their property right and the paintings that they've done is a very rewarding experience because you're improving the culture of not only the community, but you're encouraging people to continue in this particular kind of work, which is really quite good. The worldwide newspaper in this area, if you want to take a look at it, I don't think you have it in the library, I try to find it, it is the art newspaper. It's great because it gives you two things. It tells you everything that was suing who about what, all the kinds of forgeries and fakes that are going on, and then it gives you all the best uh, information with the sale prices for the artworks at the auction houses and all the kinds of things that are going on with the restoration of lost art, theft, and all those kinds of things. It's a great little newspaper, and it's fun to read. It's got a lot of pictures in it, and a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of put that way. Um, we're going to put the other thing on. Um, there is a law firm I'm going to mention, and I put it. Oh, there it is. Thank you. A um, friend of ours is Thaddeus Stauber, who used to be the legal counsel for the Art Institute in Chicago. He used to come in and talk to my art law class. He used to bring in an art lawyer, and then he used to bring in a gallery lawyer, a gallerist, I'm sorry, to bring in a gallery, and then I'd bring in a couple of artists to go talk about their experiences, and a museum director or two, so that they get a sense of what kind of things people are really trying to deal with in this kind of an industry. But Nixon Peabody, which has a worldwide law firm and a big operation here in Boston, they have, because of the nature of what's happening in the art area, they have a whole new unit that they put together a few years ago called Art and Cultural Institutions Practice. And this was a little flyer that just announced that they assisted the Fine Arts Museum in, in Chicago to uh, raise a couple million dollars for a collection from a collector that they were about to, to work with and do all the legal documents about passing the collection from the, the potential estate in, into the museum for purposes of the museum's holding. So it's a wide, wide-ranging area of, of interest. Artists sometimes die poor, but a lot of them don't. Uh, and Andy Warhol, when he died, left an estate of $100 million. Not too bad for people who live all from Campbell's and Gorilla Box. Um, his personal collection of art was 10,000, which um, I think Sotheby sold for $25 million. And he owned 75,000 pieces of artwork. And the lawyers in that estate made $7 million for processing that estate. So it does have potentials if you meet the right people. Uh, Scott Hody is in Chicago, is a very famous art person who's gotten in the business simply because people started to ask him about questions. And he's been a good supporter of the lawyers for the creative arts. Um, 
He got into the business because he went to an opening reception and Christo showed up. And they started a conversation with Christo and took it from there. So he's been unwrapping um, things all over the world. Uh, and those are how things happen. That's, that's the kind of thing that's, that's a lot of fun. And from that kind of a relationship, you can imagine the amount of work that his law firm has picked up, particularly in the regulatory issues and the licensing issues and everything else that gets done with that kind of an activity. Uh, so it's, it's quite good. So there is, there is some things to be done in, in, in here. With respect to art law, it really breaks down into two categories. One is art law as it looks at the artist and the relationships that the artist has with the world around the artist. So it really kind of focuses and takes all the courses you've been taking or the practice that you're in and it kind of puts it into a particular milieu. Uh, and why you need a course like this or why it's being taught in schools is because not only is it a question of the law, you have to understand the nature of the customs and the trade practices within the industry. A lot of our a lot of art is done by handshakes. A lot of art is done by verbal agreements, which Kate says is worth the paper we written on. Um, a lot of it is in, in the whole process of trying to figure out how this artist, who is so totally weird, uh, isn't going to get arrested when they put the exhibit up and it's got issues with child pornography, it's got issues with human bodies, it's got issues with things that might be considered to be obscene, or in some cases, as one of our clients came by one day, are just plain illegal. Um, this one fellow, you know, whose name I will not mention, decided that he wanted to forge postage stamps and created a whole series of posted stamps, mailed them to himself, and then made an exhibit out of it. The post ins postal inspector's office of the United States Post Office found this very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and the postal inspector came by, believe it or not, because of course the gallery advertised the fact that they were doing this, and uh, seized all the work, closed down the gallery, and all hell broke loose to try to get the stuff back. Finally, they got it out through negotiations, but it's not unusual to have those kind of problems. If you deal with museums, always problems with gifts, with donations, and the nature of the work. You, know, you don't want to put Maple Park up in Cincinnati. You don't want to do a few things in the portrait gallery in, in the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. You don't want to have uh, irreligious issues with respect to very religious objects. Uh, it creates all kinds of problems. So you're in constitutional law. You're in free speech, First Amendment. Uh, you're in the whole issue of what constitutes obscenity. Uh, and it's amazing. The joy of it is that art moves. And in the United States, you've got 50 different jurisdictions to deal with, plus the federal government. And then when you take it overseas, you have a whole other series of issues they have to deal with, because their laws are all basically different. And so when you deal with a piece of artwork, uh, you're going to have a wonderful time. We gave a beautiful lecture in Prague for the International Bar Association a couple of years ago. And it was really simple. It was entitled, How to Advise a High-End Client Who Wants to Buy a $500,000 Piece of Artwork in Europe and Get It Home. And it was all about all the kinds of issues that you had to do to protect your client so that, in fact, when they got it back to the United States, it is what it is, and there's all kinds of issues of you know, authentication and warranties and things of that nature. Customs are a real problem. Not customs in the United States, not so much, but there are now a whole series of cultural property laws. I teach a separate course called International Business and Trade and Art Antiquities and Cultural Property. And it's all about the movement of art, the illicit and illicit movement of art and antiquities across, across the world. And the problem is people are now protecting their cultural property. So for most things of a certain age, usually over 100 years or so, you have to get a license to get it out of the country. The cultural ministry does not want it to leave. So you need a license to do that. If you don't do that, then you commit a crime in the country by taking it out illegally. Then you have a problem of, you know, do you tell the US Customs that you can bring it in? Yes, you can. No problem. It depends on if there are a couple of treaty agreements with respect to countries under the Cultural Property Implementation Act. But the question is bringing it in. Where do most people make the mistakes? And I beat the art students over the head with this. Don't mess up the valuation of the property. If you're bringing in a $2 million painting, tell them it's a $2 million painting. I used to prosecute all the, the 
false official statements when I was in the Justice Department. You know, if the painting is $2 million, tell them it's $2 million. Don't tell them it's $50. Because you've just signed a declaration to the federal government that, in fact, lying. The art comes in duty free. Not a problem. But, you know, people don't think that way. So, and particularly for law students, when you become lawyers and law students, you never want to have a customer problem. Pay all the duties. They're not much anymore. It's well worth it. But if you go on their list just trying to smuggle something in and they think you're a character, you're going to have a lot of trouble traveling internationally for the next couple of years. You really, really well. Okay. Other than that, the other issues that you deal with the artists in the museums is the nature of how they get the work, how it moves, how they insure it. Uh, the artist is always concerned about consignment agreements. Art really changes hands two ways. It's through a purchase, whereby the dealer buys it, or somebody else buys it directly, like we did with the art show here at the current museum. Or you do it on a commission situation and uh, through consignments. Some states, Illinois particularly, has a very rigorous consignment law. Most states don't. And so the whole issue with the artist is getting an understanding of what they've agreed to. And sometimes it's very simple, and sometimes it's very, very difficult. In Chicago, what happened, unfortunately, was one weekend, the art district burned down. And in there was people's life's work in, in the galleries and in the studios. And a number of the art galleries didn't have insurance on the artwork. And so they were in a situation where the artists lost all their work. And the galleries, of course, went into bankruptcy. So everybody was in a bad situation. So you find yourself working with artists, thinking about their problems. They're very, very happy to know that they can come and talk to a lawyer. Because in their professional training, they're really not educated in this area. And so they're hungry for the information. And um, you have a friend for life. Uh, and they're just wonderful people to vacation with and have a good time with. Uh, we've been working with the Department of Cultural Affairs here, uh, Cultural Resources. Um, and the dean, very kindly and wisely, um, we're going to put on, through the Department of Cultural Resources and uh, the University of the Interest School of Law, an art uh, and law day on the 24th of June, statewide, for talking about issues in New Hampshire about arts and the law. So I would encourage you to come to that. I think they'll be an extremely nominal fee for, for law students and, and people of that nature. It is a growing field. What it does, as I started off with, is it makes your resume look a little better because everybody wants to have somebody in the firm who knows what to do with those crazies when they walk in the door with this new music, you know, with this theatrical production they want to go put on the boards, with this artwork that somebody wants to buy or they've inherited and they're not sure what to do with it, or the gallery is not really giving back the artwork after they've loaned it for purposes of the art show. And from there, you can build up a very, very nice practice. Not very many people know what's going on in this particular business. So I go back to my opening remark. 25 million and counting is not a bad practice. So enjoy. Thank you very much.